Hey guys, this is Sean with Dust and Moonlight. Today I'm going to be releasing my first video about the band Swans reviewing their new album, The Beggar, which just came out yesterday on the 23rd. Um, this band I recently got into, and I have heard all of their albums, almost all of them, for the first time in the last month or so. This band, at first, I didn't really get. The first time I heard them was about a year ago with Soundtracks for the Blind, and it was a very overwhelming work, at least to say, in terms of its scale, in terms of the amount of songs there were, in terms of the content on the record. It's a lot to take in on first listening, and especially when you've never listened to Swans before. This band, I recently decided to go through all their albums to see how I would develop in terms of how I feel about this band, and listening to all the records helped me get an appreciation for the band, I would say. I definitely learned where they were coming from on Soundtracks for the Blind, how their style developed and changed into what they are to this day. The Beggar is basically an extension of their present sound that they've been maintaining since around 2010 or 2012, and it I, or even arguably since Soundtracks of the Blind, which was, I would argue, their first post-rock album. In terms of what these records sound like, post-rock is this big, momentous, m monumental, I should say, kind of sound that is all about engulfing you within its sound. It's about timbre, the tones, it's not really about much about melody or really distinctive, like, hooks or anything. It's more about creating almost like a soundtrack, so to speak, for a movie. That's the best way I would like to describe it, but the Swans, they've been developing this sound, and on their record, The Beggar, I feel with this release, they've definitely created something that is more interesting than, than anything they've done since To Be Kind, which is their best album, personally, 2014. I'm going to be going through all tracks, and I'll just be telling you what I think of each track. The Parasite is the first track on the album, The Beggar, and it has a very interesting droney mood for me the very first two minutes. It's nothing, it's nothing super weird or out of place for swans at this point. A lot of their music is repetitive, droney, um, post-rock kind of sound nowadays. It's also got in terms of this record as a whole, has the gothic country sound you would expect from Angels of Light, this other band project that Michael Jarrah, the singer of Swans, did. And I find the timbre that plays every few seconds in this part of the song very interesting. It's kind of like this weird mystical synth. I'm going to be using the word mystical a lot in terms of this review, but the guitar is pretty. It's playing some interesting notes. The mood is very weak sounding, not like in terms of quality, but it's like kind of lethargic, almost lazy. Not necessarily, but if you've ever listened to Swans before, they're a very repetitive band, but this isn't necessarily a bad thing for me. At 3.30, where it's just a cappella, I find it's a very interesting transition. I think Michael Jira's vocals are really rough and interesting enough to get the vibe they're going for across, and they sound really good just by themselves. The background vocals and overall atmosphere that comes in after this part is gorgeous, personally. It gives me some heavy Genesis vibes, actually, from their uh, rock opera album, The Land Lies Down on Broadway. You got some nice guitar tones coming in. The song overall creates this really just mystical sound, and that's really a best way to describe a lot of their newer stuff is mystical, magical, almost kind of a bit pagan sounding or something for lack of a better word, but it's very meditative. I love the song so far. It's got this creep, dark, creepy vibe I love to hear from my swans overall. Yet it actually feels a bit fresher sonically than the previous two records. Ever since their, my personal favorite swans record, To Be Kind, in 2014, which I consider the magnum opus, um, it feels like they perfected their post-rock sound, the modern sound that they've been doing without having been able to add something that I find extremely interesting. And it's felt like they haven't done enough to make each later release feel different enough for me. It's still 
I would say, I mean, like, the releases are actually quite good. Glowing Man, I think, is an awesome record. But it stands out more, this record, I'd say personally, because of the ritual ambient sound to it. The gothic country influences are more fleshed out in this. And I hope for this record, when I was listening to this song, that it was going to be more introspective and fragile sounding. And like a look into death, I would say compared to the other Swans releases before it. A lot of Swans of music actually focuses on the themes of death, but I was hoping that this one would go headfirst right into it. Michael Jarre is an older guy, no offense, who already writes about death a lot, and it's a very common thing to be thinking about when you're like 60 years old. No offense. It's just... I was hoping... I'm hoping that this record basically encapsulate that, and... That one now having heard the full album actually does really well. Um, Paradise is mine. The second song opens with a light introduction. This tremolo, this tremolo on some sort of stringed instrument that it sounds exotic. It's really cool. The bass playing is light, and it's this is tapping and the ride of the drums. At 44 seconds, we get this really neat but simple guitar riff on what feels like a tr and what this thing that sounds like a triangle. Weirdly, it's definitely got. Really nice vibe to it. This almost calming sound that is still a little ominous. There's some really nice textural sounds in the background adding to the atmosphere, which I'm unsure what they even are. At this point, the first two songs are both some of my favorite recent Swan songs. I think they are the be better, possibly be anything f found on Leaving Meaning or maybe The Glowing Man for me. Um, truth be told, I heard every Swan's album recently for the first time, other than Soundtracks for the Blind, and it's complicated keeping my opinions really, like, fully fleshed out well in my head. I definitely need to be release, uh, rehearing these albums a second time just to feel like I know everything about my opinion. It's not even necessarily that I don't get the albums, it's the more the fact that my opinion on them is, like, I, I was listening to these daily, and I've only heard several of these records only once. I feel like I get a better grip on how I feel about them with more time spent with them, basically. Um, it really... Honestly, it's it's weird. I believe Glowing Man's a masterpiece, yet it's substantially weaker than To Be Kind to the point it feels kind of disappointing. But for this album, I don't really get quite the same vibe that this was a disappointment, even though Glowing Man was a huge success, I would say. Uh, Le Leaving Meaning is also a great record, the record before this, but it's definitely more substantially weaker than To Be Kind. It's, And uh, the fact is that, um, that it's actually one of my favorite things like about Swans, if you want to be picky, is the fact that... like. Uh, the post rock sound was perfected on that record, but here it, f it feels like they're changing enough to the point that I feel all content with that. I would say I do wish they would change more like they used to in the past. That with each record before Soundtracks to the Blind in 1997 or Sex, I forget, they were changing their sound basically every other record or every two records. Like, you got the kind of sound that you got from Ch Children of God with its gothic and kind of post-punky, like, uh, industrial sounding to Burning World to White Light, which is a lot more folky and uh, still gothic sounding. And then you got to go from to that to the Love of Life to Great Annihilator, which is a very straightforward, still experimental rock, like, post-punk release. And you never know what you're going to get with before they started their post-rock era. And here, it, you definitely have more expectations, like, oh, they're gonna go into it with a post-rock sound. And yeah, uh, I will say, um, you, but they've been essentially ma making the same j release and the t same type of genre, I would say, since their comeback record in 2010. They've, um, I'm trying to think of what to say here. Oh yeah, the part where Michael Jera um, says, is there really a mind over and over again in this song is a simple and direct but thought-provoking question, personally. Uh, the song continually adds up in intensity and at 642 has some really cool timbres, I would say. 
the ending is really cool with the flute and ritual ambient feel again. Overall, it's got this new balance between new and old, and that, that's one of the things I love most about this record so far. The third song, Los Angeles City of Dead, is the first song to sound more awake, I would say. It's got a really nice bass tone, overall atmosphere it creates is really ceremonious. It's got just this sort of feeling like a summoning has happening or some dark magic or something. It's fairly common for swans, but still cool. The ending has some cool synths playing. These discordant chords actually reminded me a little of the monks, I would say. Overall, the song is short but sweet, which is really weird to hear from swans. It's uh, very memorable. I mean, it is very repetitive, but I would say it's actually one of my least favorite on the record, just on the record, just because of the fact it doesn't have as much substance compared to the others. Michael has done the fourth track. The Glockenspiel's so pretty. It, oh, like they started introducing the chime-like instruments into this at this point, and. I was having a great time with this. It was a wonderful addition to the compositions. I'm not even sure if it's Glockenspiel, but there's this chime, like, innocent sounding instruments, like, all across the record. And against those these dark synths and brooding vocals, it just creates this great juxtaposition. At two minutes, it feels like we're about to ascend, and then we do. And the mood it creates after is downright joyful. like. Upbeat, snow is falling, heaven ascending, vibes, Christmas. I hate to say that, but out of this context, this song could actually work in a Christmas film. I hate saying that, but yeah, it's probably my favorite song so far and possibly my favorite on the album. It feels really weird to hear Swans do something that feels happy for lack of a better word. It's got a really beautiful sound, it's cheerful, and yet it's also about dying at the same time. It's weird to say that after 40 years, Swans have a song that sounds truly upbeat, considering their reputation generally is that of a band who's very dark, or at the very least, just somewhat dark. Now, this sound even is at like peace, I would say. Even Blind is not truly happy, which is one of their most beautiful ballads, I would say, it's sad, even though it's not on a studio LP, sadly. It's got a optimistic, but kind of still dark, neutral vibe to this, while this is more up, just, like, unabashedly, like, at peace. Kind of, that's the best way to say it. It sounds like Michael Jira is at peace in this song. It goes back to a similar feeling at the beginning of the song, towards the last minute, and it's weird that they're singing about themselves. That's one thing I've noticed about this. This is the only song I could think about where he's saying his own name in a song. And it's, it's a very literal song, which I mean, I like, but it's, it's weird. Unforming the um, fifth, no wait, fourth song. This really feels like uh, Angel of Li Angels of Light track. Since the last record, there's been this gothic country touch, but here this really feels like a track off of How I Loved You, which is awesome. This even sounds happier, I would say. Like It's got this beautiful, bittersweet vibe that reminds me of how like a mother says goodnight to a child and sings lullabies. It's very comforting. This has a beautiful chime-like timbre as well in the background, and the vocals are warm and comforting. It's, it's beautiful. Like, the record as a whole is really got some of the most beautiful sound Swans has ever made, I would say, which is really just something. Uh, and it's a stark contrast to where they began, like, with Stay Here, the first track off of the very first Swans album, which was this industrial, just brutal, heavy, infernal sounding record from 1983. It sounds legitimately like the opposite of that. Like we've gone from heaven, or we've gone from hell and now we're in heaven or something. And the way Michael Jira says freedom, I feel like he sung something like this before in another song, in a, some other Swans album. But here it really, like I remember the other time being more ironic, while here it feels like he's legitimately finding some sort of freedom. I, that's how I'm interpreting this personally. Uh, the guitar at the end is gorgeously recorded, like the production on this holy f Like along with the instrument that's doing the tremolo, which I th think is a guitar as well. 
I, I know Michael Jira treats every album like as his potentially his last for since for like a while since maybe soundtracks for the blind but uh, here it's like i mean you get uh, something very different from the previous records and it has more of a finale vibe to it on some of these songs you know to be kind is an epic innovative large record full of amazing songs and a dark prophetic sound and yeah, I know, though, if I were to end a career with Swans, like, I'd want to do something entirely different from that. and Maybe show a more tender side of the band to kind of convey that coming to grips with approaching the afterlife. Um, the fifth song, The Beggar, this title track opens pretty similar to previous songs here. It's also dark and eerie in the beginning with little build-up drone, but the song is increasing just barely in tension for a few minutes. It's very easy for me to get into this stuff, though, because I've grown attached to this kind of sound and swans in general. I kind of lose myself in the sonic palette that swans creates. Sorry, I was yawning. The, sound, the snare sounds amazing at four minutes. Like, it comes in with this great drum beat that's really basic, but it has this massive feeling. Boom, bah, boom, bah, boom. It's just towards the end of it, you hear the, some sort of build up once more, and this is a badass song, honestly, during these parts. It feels like there's an inner tension just waiting to break free during what I would say is kind of the verses. And then when it does go on that like snare, kick snare part, it's just, damn. It keeps me on the edge despite taking its time with these quiet verses. At 805, there's this vocal part. Honestly makes me laugh. One thing about Swans, you kind of have to laugh sometimes at how un... Like, un bashedly weird some of their vocals can be like uh how can you take some of the things michael jira sings seriously i, I f feel like it is almost tongue-in-cheek like they're trying to be a little funny which is how silly they can be but at the same time you still take it seriously which is impressive to say the least song returns to the basic drum beat the hi-hat or ride i can barely hear i will say i noticed during the second chorus part kinda and the part is great personally it feels like an awesome part to a movie where a betrayal ha is happening or some equally dramatic event overall just great song and track six no more of this um my god this really is an angel of angels of light song it's so gothic country sounding like it's probably the most gothic country sounding song swans has ever done and so calming you could swear it was from the other michael Jira project and for those unaware michael Jira is the singer of swans and angels of light uh, overall though i don't think it matters that much if something sounds like swans or Angels of Light, just because all of it is still headed by the same creative talent, you know? Michael Jira. You could literally be cradled like a baby while this song plays, and it would feel like a close encounter with heaven. I'm not even really listening to the lyrics of this, but it feels like Michael Jira is almost saying no more with this life. Like, this record in general feels obsessed with death, even more so than typical swans records and it's not in your usual tim burton or like a really bloody gory kind of way he's obsessed more with the the grandiose like the unknown factors of death and uh, yeah it creates this just epic big vibe with this record and other albums i would say the vocals leave and we get some you know further build up the spoken word part is really cool the timbres and sonic qualities here are just beautiful almost enough to make me cry this is the only song i wouldn't mind being actually longer which i haven't said that about swans like ever i think but yeah just because of my head you could actually build this up more to even like more ridiculous degrees if you wanted you could make it louder and more dynamic towards the end but I don't really mind the way it ends, it's still a beautiful song and excellent in terms of its own right, you know? Uh, ebbing, track 7, I've lost the count at this point, I'm gonna go with 7 though. At this point of the album, I love how different this record is honestly, it feels more refreshing than Glowing Man and Leaving Meaning and if the next several songs were awesome, like at this point it's basically just a masterpiece in the bag for me but 
Yeah, I would say... Oh, it was track eight. Okay, I was on track eight. Okay, then. Um, yeah, I would say that if this were... This record does beat Glowing Man for me, which is kind of amazing. Which means this record is my fourth favorite Swans album ever. Only behind Soundtracks, The Seer, and To Be Kind. And I even considered saying it'd be better than The Seer, but I really feel like I need to hear it again. Ebbing is another absolutely solid song for me. Synths in the background are really nice. And uh, playing what feels like slow arpeggios to me. There's a certain quality to them that weirdly reminded me of bagpipes just a little in terms of timbre. The sound of this album feels a lot more swan sounding to me than My Father Would Guide Me Up a Rope to the Sky, which was their, you know, comeback record after a long period of time, like a hiatus away from music. That record sounded a lot more like Angels of Light, while this honestly feels like it's like a it's gothic country and it mixes a lot with post rock in ways I've never heard before, so it still sounds very much like Swans. Uh, also, I would say that The Seer personally is Swans' uh, true comeback in a way. If you, that record feels like the one where it sounds like, okay, the sw sound of Swans we're familiar with is back. This song is just beautiful, transcendent. It literally feels like you're leaving your body if you give yourself to the music. Like, I hate saying all that because it makes me feel like some silly hippie or trying to be overly spiritual. When the things that are happening are kind of spiritual, but at the same time, music's just sound if you want to get technical with it. <laughs> uh, for real, the way the music ebbs and flows on this and pounds you without destroying you is really pretty. There's a lot of stuff to appreciate about the compositions and the ambition in general of Swans in this record. The part at 613 has this beautiful combination of a wonderful bass line, choir vocals, bells, and some neat drum playing that is constantly doing something different that I really appreciate. In general, these songs have like several parts that you could listen to and like switch your attention between and yeah, there's just a lot going. Um, track nine track nine <laughs> why I can't I have what I want anytime that I want uh, the opening is more ominous than the last several tracks the sound honestly reminds me of the creepier musical moments of 2001 a space odyssey there's some neat orchestral instruments creating this texture in the background the bass line does this hammer on pull off thing that kind of reminds me of their biggest hit screenshot it's being used very differently right now in a different context but it's still got a similar vibe at 2 30 the addition the addition of more vocal parts was awesome this part in general is haunting <laughs> like um it's a, like a dirge or requiem. It gives off this funeral march sound, like a funeral doom metal or something, or just a literal funeral. The drums are also playing this, this slow tempo, and it feels like that. And the, there's timpani, I believe, which is awesome. I, whatever what that really big drum sound is, it sounds amazing. Guitar part gets layered here and sounds great. It, it starts playing what the bass was playing, while the bass joins in unison with the drums, which create this massive layer of just to overall. It's a big full sound. 530 sees yet another expansion to the sound palette. It gets bigger and more anxious sounding, and the acapella part here is awesome. And you get these background vocals coming in, all hom ominously singing with this aggressive guitar part. This is another highlight, honestly, for me. It really feels like a great funeral march of a song and I love how this record looks at death in so many different ways like it comes to it with uh, different views like from the, f the funeral from being introspective to the fear of it um, you got the positive and negative sides of the of death and how humanity feels about it in general through Michael Jira's feelings about it um, if this isn't Swan's last record, I will honestly be surprised if they could beat this. This really feels like a last album, or like second to last album to me. Like, I, 
I doubt you could find much of a better ending than what they've picked with this. I really suspect they won't be able to beat it if they make another record. Swans are an old band, and they've been post-rock for more than a decade now. There really isn't... Okay, you can do a lot with post-rock, but if you are to do a lot with post-rock, you have to make it sound very different. And, yeah, there really just isn't a lot more you can do, I think, with the sound they've been doing. Uh, this record in general is a great expansion to it and does different things with the post-rock angle they've been... the, the genre they're using. But I'm st still, this feels like a refinement of like a gothic country post-rock sort of sound. And I don't think they could do that much better. So they really have to do something different. This track is 43 minutes long. The Beggar Lover 3, in parentheses 3. Well, this song is easily the longest swan song I have ever ever seen in my life and I was a little intimidated. <laughs> um, I was a little intimidated at first. Um, I'm not entirely in fear of it, but God, like they really went all out on this record. Like they ha they've had really long epics on every album since like the Seer or something, but this thing dominates like a good portion of the album's length. I mean, it's 40 minutes long. This is a two hour album. You do the math. Like, I have my reservations, it won't be absolutely amazing, but I really doubt it, because I've loved every song that Swans has done before that are really, really long. Like, from the Seer to, to Tucson Louveteur, um, these songs normally have uh, Tucson Louveteur, that's my apologies. These songs normally have mind-boggling senses of scale and feel like some sort of massive giant... Like, they're some of the biggest and most massive lounge soundscapes I have ever heard in my life. They create this sense of epic proportion that is unrivaled for me. And this song is no exception. The intro is this drone. It builds up with bells. It's just this weird combination of feelings and moods. It's both uneasy yet pretty, and you're unsure of where it's going. The long songs in general know... They have to do many different things in general to stay interesting. If you're not a fan of their normal songs, you might actually be able to admire at least these longer compositions because of the technical requirements, the composing, recording, and the making of this music to this scale is just extremely difficult on its own and is an achievement. At four minutes, the drones disappear, and there's this cool part where the bells are by themselves, but at that point, a woman monologues about this creepy creature approaching, and the quote, like, one of the parts of it that I recognized, or at least uh, remembered, was, appetite is never filled. Um, it sounds like it's a metaphor for death, which I wouldn't be surprised from this record. The part after this with this cascade of big giant drums just pounding away literally gives me chills like literally made me feel cold um the way the drowning sound droning sound comes in as well reminds me of a fighter jet or something it is a it's a synth that's an orchestra part or it's a recording of like something that's messed with there's several timbres on this record i just question like how were they made in the beginning like with swan's albums i could easily tell each part distinctly and how the uh, instruments were fused together but around to be kind's era there's so much going on i can i can't really normally tell every single individual layer or what's happening entirely but here i don't even know what some of these sounds are at seven minutes, we have a wave of vocals in some sort of church-sounding landscape. Seven, like the inside of a church, really reverby. Seven thirty brings this big bassy whole note that might be a synth. It's also droning, but it creates this uncomfortable feeling for me. A brass section on top goes, and the bass note starts to like change notes instead of just being one note. It reminds me of this, the first song on Bolt Throwers, for those once loyal. It's just like this feeling of there's this impending storm or this, this this horror that is intense. I get real cheer chills from this, honestly. It's some kind of grand massive death, basically. It really creates this feeling of doom at massive scale. 
The vocals are so strange sounding. I can't tell if there's throat singing or just some weird production going on, but the low notes in general are enough to honestly shake a building. In general, this song's keeping you surprised with its various moods and tones and the strangeness of it. And some of the most confusing, like, some of the most confusing music I've heard Swans release before or ever. Like, I feel like I've understood everything they've done before, but with this, I'm quite, like, just blown away by the changes and the ideas that go into different types of ideas. The drones of of this song are so mysterious on this, like, beast of a song. Like, this section goes on for several minutes, yet it doesn't get boring to me. Um... Just because it creates a mood for you to get attached to. It creates a really foreboding atmosphere and does so creatively. 756 drums come in and they're some sort of like... They also kind of like that big sounding kick snare. It's like really tasty sounding. This is actually better, I would say. The snare is possibly the most sna massive snare I've ever heard in a song before. The bass comes in and it plays this fucking badass post-punky riff and my god this is just an awesome part of the song. Really badass. The moods and various changes are just surprising honestly. And this part is nasty and primal and it tur turns you into straight up god of death it feels like. The timbres are delicious and Honestly, this might be the best production that Swans has ever had before. It's so tasty and sounds so awesome. Okay, I feel like they've had better compositions on To Be Kind, but this has an incredible sound. And 21 minutes is just vocals. It's jaw-dropping, really unnerving and strange. That's what you expect from Swans. One of the most uncompromising experimental weirdest groups out there personally. When more vocals come in, the female vocals layer on top and create like this suddenly like a heavenly sound in this song it's not your typical heaven though it's more like this unfathomable kind of like uh, uh just c weird cthulhu just experience um 24 minutes uh, there's these horror sounding strings or something uh the vocals edit exit and we're left with i don't even know what these yeah, I don't know if these are strings. They sound like something's. They sound like, uh, sh the like the strings you get from the horror parts of The Shining, but it's so like they done something weird to it. Like maybe electronically messed with it. I know for a fact any normal music person who only listens to mainstream stuff would be like, "What the fuck is this at this part?" Or straight up feel uncomfortable with these types of tones. I just don't know what to think. Now it sounds like Michael Jira has become an alien and is burping and there's this weird call and response there's a knocking on the door a weird baby and alien share the call and response like the baby making sounds and the alien making sounds and it gets the knocking gets more intense and the song exits, exits this part and goes into a synth drone with a different kind of experience um, you can't listen to this with a typical ear for music for real. You have to listen to it. Not like it's a song or even a composition. It's just part sound collage, part just pure emotion, part composition. And I get the ideas it's going for, like every song about life and death. Um, and also I feel like the sounds of the baby actually kind of remind me of To Be Kind because the album cover, there's a baby and they use a lot of just baby imagery and like youthful imagery in general which I think is a metaphor for life or something. This is one of the most ambitious that songs Swans has ever done, honestly. Possibly the most ambitious. It feels insane. It's disjointed, kind of, and alien, but that's kind of what I love about it. It's bold and out there and very emotive, and I love it personally. Like, it's possibly the best track on the album, though I will certainly need to re-listen to this record to make sure that I can get a better understanding of how I feel towards the music. I do th I do know for a fact I love this though. The part at 34 minutes is a bit more normal. The is a repeating guitar riff with a beautiful tone against some cool drums playing in a regular time signature. A lot more normal than what was happening before. Bass also has a cool riff. It's cool timbres in the background that, that swell and stuff. 39 minutes has this nice bell-like instrument and overall I really like the innocent chimes on this part. And there's just always like this nice juxtaposition against darker sounds. At this point, the song, it feels like has beaten me to death. 
into submission to liking it. <laughs> but just be by the size of how impressive the ambition and scale is. It's, it's clearly something genuine, 100% and amazing. But yeah, after this song, I felt so tired, like I had to take a nap or something. But I have one more song for this album. Uh, the last track, The Memorious. This song instantly starts, hitting you with a pounding rhythm, loud volume. There's some baby that cries in the background, I believe, at certain moments. The spoken word part is cool. It's an interesting way to end the record, to say the least. Though, I actually feel like the ending would have been best on the longest song. Or one of the more ballady, heavenly sounding songs would be what I would do. I would have actually put this track earlier in the album, just because it feels... It's a bit more repetitive than I like for Swans, and it's um, one of the most awake sounding and energetic on the album. I, I just feel like it would have worked better at the earlier part of the album. when It started off quiet, then it was starting to get louder again. You could have put it maybe as the fourth track or something after the third. It would kind of flow better for me. Overall, though, it's still an excellent song. The only complaint I have here is the placement of it on the track listing. It doesn't quite feel like an ending to me. Towards the end, there's some nicely layered tones on top, though, that sound cool. This album is a behemoth like every Swans album since The Seer. It's two hours at long. This is easily my fourth favorite of the career, and I really love the ending quality about it. Like, it feels like it's an ending to something probably the ending of Michael Jira or Swans or something, but I will be happy if they release more music in the future. I mean, I'd love to hear more Swans in general, but I just feel like with this band, there's... I just can't imagine what else we would do, or if you could make something that's better than the Bagger at this point. I definitely feel like they've peaked with The Seer and To Be Kind and Soundtracks and their best ideas are before them. This record, though, is still a very impressive testament to the legacy of Swans, and if it were their last album, I would be totally satisfied. It kind of has a similar vibe to something like a Moon-Shaped Pool by Radiohead, which I also feel like is another record that should be the ending to a band's discography, but I'm not sure if it will be. In general, <sighs> excellent album. I highly recommend it. If you have never listened to Swans, I would definitely recommend starting with To Be Kind, or maybe just going through their discography if you have enough time. Like uh, I feel like going through the discography of a band who you genuinely are interested in helps you to understand where they're coming from. With listening to Swans' discography, I feel like I had an amazing, incredible journey of discovering the different aspects of a human being and seeing them evolve in real time and yeah there's something about music that can really capture a shadow of a person that really is one of my favorite aspects of it you get to hear part of someone's soul in it i would say this is sean with just a moonlight rock on <laughs>